Morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Awesome. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> hey, so we're still talking about Luke, right? I've been gone for a week. We still doing Luke? Okay, good, because that's what I had prepared. I was hoping that was... I wasn't going to have to wing it. I want to start off this morning in a prayer, and I want to pass the box around. Uh, if you're not familiar with our box... Box is just the names of some people that are in our hearts and minds most, most, for the most part because we don't believe they have a relationship with Christ or a church. So what we've done as a leadership group, and we did, started this over a year ago, and we still haven't even really looked in here and see who's in here. Um, I might even be in here. I don't even know. But it's just people that have been on our hearts and our minds, especially people that are living outside of a life with God that we'd like to see have that salvation, to have that life with Christ. So... Uh, what we normally do sometimes when we start a sermon, I'll just pass it around, and when it comes to, just hold on to it, and just pray uh, for God to, to, uh, to bless and to be with, and you know, pray for the people's salvation that, uh, that are in this box, and if you don't mind, I'm going to start right here with you, man. And uh, I'm going to start us off uh, in sort of the, the prayer in the same vein. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for this beautiful morning. I thank you for your beautiful creation. Lord, I thank you for the comfort of this room where we can worship you where we can read and study and uh, uh, learn about and preach about your word. Lord, I thank you for all the sacrifices that you make for us, Lord, and I ask that you would forgive me and all of us when we uh, feel the call to go and for whatever reason we resist it. Uh, Lord, and we just, uh, we thank you for the successes that you've given us in our spiritual walk, and we ask that you would continue to give us boldness, to give us courage, but to fill us with grace and mercy as we go on the mission field in our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so Luke chapter 9. Um, man. You know those parts of Scripture that you just won't leave you alone? You, everybody's thinking about a verse or two. When you read through, you know, if you're reading your Bible frequently, now some of you may be new to it and you, you haven't gotten there yet, and that's Okay. But, man, you just, there's just those passages that you don't want to deal with where you are, but, man, they just will not leave you alone. Let me tell you what Luke 9 did to me while I was in Panama City. Of course, feeling called there, right? <laughs> well, you know, that happens sometimes, but they were okay. So, you know, Luke 9 is filled with things I love to talk about, to teach about, to preach about, to study about, to discuss. Verse 1 through 5, Jesus empowers and sends his disciples. And y'all remember our C-E-T-S chant, we're called, equipped, trained, and sent. I mean, those, that's an awesome, empowering story that gives us courage to go out. And then verse 6 through 11, all the works of mercy, healing the sick, and casting out demons, like stuff that, you know, Hollywood should be jealous of, that really happened. You know, that's awesome. There's so much just gold in there to mine out of those scriptures and for us to learn and to encourage us and to get us going. 12 through 17, feeding 5,000 people. Jesus fed 5,000 people with two fish, five loaves of bread. You know, there's so much in there about, you know, giving what we have to God and how he can multiply and give it back, press down and running over. I mean, those, those sort of things. 20, uh, 28 through 36, the transfiguration. One of my favorite parts. It's like a glimpse into the kingdom of God. He takes three people. Right after he says, some of you won't die until you sing of the kingdom of God, then he takes three of them and they go see it. I mean, you get to see Moses and Elijah, and it kind of gives us a glimpse into, you know, a little bit of what heaven will look like when we reach that destination. And then, you know, at the end, casting out warring clean spirits, just displaying this power and authority that he had, and that he's entrusted to all his disciples. Those are exciting, empowering stories. But with all the miracles, and with all of, you know, casting out demons, with all of the great things he did, he keeps taking us back to something. He keeps taking us back to something. Let's look at verse 43 and 44. He just cast out an unclean spirit, and people were amazed at what he had done. Verse 43 says, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God, but while everyone marveled at all the things which he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down. Oh, I know you're impressed with all the stuff you're seeing. You're seeing the majesty and glory of God, and that's great, but let these words sink down. 
into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Not as fun. But the most important thing to him. Jesus always wants, is trying to get us to the cross. Trying to get us to the cross. And all these great things, these powerful, important things are happening. These important lessons we're learning. He always, and he keeps doing it. And he starts right here in Luke 9 and he just keeps doing it. He reminds them, let this sink into you. Don't forget about the cross. The hardest part of our Christian walk and the most important part of our Christian walk is going from comfort to cross. Comfort to cross. There were some very great things that happened while we were going on vacation, some inspiring things, some powerful things that happened for us and in other people's lives that we experienced. But when I'm sitting beside a pool in front of Panama City Beach and I'm reading through this and I get to verse 22... The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. And he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Verse 26, I don't see it crocheted on many pillows. <laughs> that is not a me-centric verse. That's a cross-centric verse. It's hard. You know, I read through it and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm on this wooden beach chair. I was like, well, the cross was wooden. And I, you know... <laughs> The speech chairs wouldn't. Maybe it'll give me a splinter. Well, I, okay, thank you. I need you to listen, okay? Thank you. Some of them did have cushions. Cross didn't have a cushion. So I'm like, okay, well, but, you know, there's, there's the bright sunlight, so my transfiguration. God inspired me to do something on the transfiguration. Inspire me to do something on the beauty of your creation. And in verse 23, if anyone desires to come out after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. And follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So Sunday we went down there. The first Sunday we were down there, we went to a church called North Star Church. And I need to email and apologize to the pastor for stealing his sermon and making one of my points. But this is this is total. Was it plagiarism? I think it's okay because when preachers preach, they want to give it to you and equip you, so it's yours. But this is straight up plagiarism. Okay. And inspiration, so don't be afraid. This is still, still definitely uh, inspired. But my, we read the word des desire. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a move from self-indulgence to self-sacrifice. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. From comfort to cross. Now, I want to talk about three obstacles. They're not the only three. Maybe even not the top three. But I want to talk about three obstacles, I think, that keep us from moving, from taking that journey from comfort to cross. From comfort to cross. Number one is self-indulgence. Right? Self-sacrifice doesn't sound as fun as self-indulgence, but what's funny about that is when we think, you know, when we, get, we, we talk about whatever it is, that new car we want, the new boat, the relationship, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it is, we think that that's going to be the thing that's going to make us happy and fulfill us. And then we think, hey, when I, when I go out somewhere, paying for somebody else's meal or just tipping a server something they've probably never seen before, even though they did a horrible job and away for my food an hour and a half. <laughs> What's funny is we think we'd regret it if we did that, but does it, do you ever regret it when you, when you, when you make that journey? But what I do regret are the things that I thought were going to be great and fulfilling. They're never, they never deliver. They never, they never deliver. So here's something that we need to know about, our, about self-indulgence to self-sacrifice. There's three steps. It's like a progression into self-indulgence. Number one is lust, which is basically I want it. Right? Every self-indulgence starts with I want that. It has to start there, right? I want this new car. I want this 
girlfriend or mistress. I want another drink. I want to look at this thing. I want to take a second look at what I'm not supposed to take a second look at, right? I want to do it. I know I'm not supposed to, but I want to, which takes us down the road of progression, right? I, I want that, but I know I'm not supposed to have it. So what have I got to convince myself? Entitlement. I've got to convince myself that I deserve that, right? Yeah, I know, you know I've got a $35,000 salary, $500,000 house. I know I want that. I've got to figure out a way that I deserve that. Right? I've got to make my, before I can actually go and, and do the deed, I've got, to, I've got to convince myself and everybody around me that I, I deserve this thing. Third is the one that gets us stuck. Pride. I can control it. I can take, right? I can have a couple of drinks every day because, why? I can control it. I can spend a lot of money on this thing that I really want and that I don't really deserve because I can handle it, right? Yeah, it's going to be a tough payment, or yeah, this might happen, but we don't chase the rabbit down the hole a lot of times before we've already gone into, I can control it. And what ends up happening, it ends up controlling us. And I speak this from experience and heartache. Past, current, and probably future. Right? The road to self-indulgence starts with, with, I want it, I deserve it, and I can control it. The best way is to stop at I want it and chase the rabbit down the hole. Where is this going to lead? Do I really deserve it, and can I really control it? Now, I'm not saying there's, there's nothing wrong with doing things, like doing, you know, doing nice things for yourself. It's not, it's not the point. It's not the point to try to make you feel guilty. Just to recognize that this is one of the obstacles that keeps us from going to, from comfort to the cross. It says to take up the cross daily and follow me. This is a daily battle. It's going on all the time. For me, for you, I don't, I don't, need, to, I don't need you to nod. I know. I know that it's there. So number one is self-indulgence. That's, that's number one of the obstacles. Number two, this is a little bit, little bit more fun because we could talk about Facebook. FOMO. Anybody ever heard of the term FOMO? F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. Right? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to miss out. There have been studies done. I read this in the book by John Ortberg, so I'm plagiarizing him too, I guess. But they've done studies that you know, we get on social media and we do things like that to try to, uh, to feel better, right? To, well, kind of like what I talked about last time I, uh, I, got, I got to speak to you was building up the self-image, like putting up the highlight reel. But really what happens is, while we're doing that, we're looking at everybody else and we're seeing what they have and how happy they look and all this stuff, and it starts to depress us. I'm not forbidding Facebook. Don't, don't panic. But this, this is what we do. And our phones, like, um, I can even remember a time when not many people had cell phones. I remember my granddad carried that big backpack phone around at the car sale just in, just in case he needed it. But now we have them and we can't live without them. And what's the number one reason? I believe it's FOMO. We're afraid we're going to miss out. What if something happens when we're gone? You know, there are people that were challenged to follow Jesus. Let's look at the end of uh, Luke chapter 9. And this one's tough, too. This is one that really bothers me a lot. This one's like when I don't want God to really be God when I, when I read stuff like this. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid farewell to those who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one have putting his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, were these bad things that these people were wanting to do? Absolutely not. And I've lost people close to me, and I know most of you have too, and the, that pain, that raw emotion is there. Um, you're going to say bye if you're going somewhere. We're sending people off on a mission trip. They're going to say bye to the families. There's nothing wrong with that. But these people, Jesus needed them to go now, and, and they were afraid they were going to, what, miss out. And we get so afraid... Even on good things, we get so afraid of missing out on what the world has to offer or missing out on what, maybe what God had to offer someone else that we don't see the big thing that God has got right in front of us right now. Right? 
we, maybe we're not happy with the, car, the cards that God dealt us in this situation. Maybe this is not the way we wanted God to use us. So we're afraid we're missing out. But when we're afraid we're missing out, we are missing out. We're trying to look, we're missing out on what we have to leave behind in the world. I've dealt with that all week. And I've been grumbly and self loathing and been like, well, you know, they're going on a mission trip next week and I'm here in, in, on the beach. I want to miss out. I want to miss something. I was also worried about number three. I was also worried about my reputation and my status. What's everybody going to think? Let's look at verse 46 through 48. A dispute arose, arose among them to which, of them is, uh, to which of them would be the greatest. This is talking about the disciples. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is the least among you will be great. Status and reputation. Now, you know, when, we, when we begin to move and we begin to you know, obey God and try to follow him no matter wherever he wants to go, to go and to do the things he wants us to do and say the things we want us to do, we're worried about in our workplaces, in school. We're worried about our status. What are people going to think? And we get so worried about what people are going to think, we stop worrying about what God's going to think. We we become so caught up with being people pleasers that we're we're no longer God pleasers. I love Philippians four thirteen, and there's a reason that those get crocheted on pillows, and <laughs> and put you know put in picture frames, but nine twenty six doesn't. Is because, and God loves us, so there's a lot of us-centered passages in the Scripture because God loves us and cares for us. But this is a theocentric. Egocentric, me-centered. Theocentric, God-centered. And those are harder. Those are, those are harder. So what is keeping us from moving from our comfort to the cross? Comfort, fear of missing out, and our status, and our reputation. And we're going to pray this morning. We're going to send off some missionaries to eastern Kentucky who have decided to make that journey. But you know, when I look at, you know, you, you can look anywhere. And by the way, if you, want to, if you want to enjoy, like, a luxurious time on the beach, don't listen to David Platt. I don't know if you're all familiar with him or not. But, you know, you look at the things that go on globally and how much need there is for the message of the gospel, for works of mercy, and how, you know, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. And I'm saying this to me first, believe me. How I want to just stay in my comfort zone, how I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on the next Star Wars or this or that if I actually really go in and, and go 100% and head first with God and doing what he wants me to do. But not just for us, but for the church in this country, for the church around the world. If we can move from comfort to the cross, from the fear of missing out on what the world has to offer, to the fear of missing out on what God has to offer, from self-indulgence to self-sacrifice, from worried about how the world sees us to the way the world sees him. This, this is, this is for, for us that have been doing this a while. All right? We can even get so worried about our status as a Christian that we're more worried about the world, how the world sees us as a Christian rather than whether or not they're seeing God. We're worried that we're worried about our status. We're worried that somebody's going to see me eating with a tax collector or a sinner, fill in the blank for our modern day and age. And we're so worried about how they might perceive us. We're so worried about how my Christian friends and my church might perceive us that I'm not worried about how they're perceiving God. And that... Um, you know, truth with the wrong intentions is the highest form of treason. I could go spat out truth after truth after truth, but if my intention is to hurt and to build myself up and tear them down, and I'm not worried about how people see God, I'm not doing anybody any good. But think about how powerful the church would be. He's already told us that the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. They will not prevail against the church. 
So the challenge is to do that. The challenge is for me. And it's weighed hard. This is the hardest that God has weighed on me about anything in a long time. Because to be honest with you, I've got about a 5% success rate. I'm moving from my comfort zone to the cross. I like to talk about it. It's still true whether I'm doing it or not. We can absolutely change the world. How, what would our community be like if we weren't here anymore? Would they notice tomorrow? Would they be? Would, there be, would it make a difference? I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I don't know. But that's a question we ought to all ask ourselves. We have a God. We have a Christ who had it all. Streets of gold, all the descriptions in Revelation. Had it all. You talk about self-indulgence. He can have whatever he wants, do whatever he wants. He can create stuff by talking. <laughs> what did he do? Did he have to? He went from comfort to the cross for us. And for you, for me, for my children, for your children, for the people that are starving, for the kids that are caught up in sex trafficking. That... Most of us are just kind of sitting and watch suffer, if we're, if we're to be honest. We pray about it every now and then, you know, we'll throw up prayers, but what are we really getting in there and doing? He moved from comfort to the ultimate comfort, left his father and came and died for us. His desire was for us. We're going to finish today, you know, the song is so perfect that we're singing it. Zach, like, I called and you answered. I called and you answered. I called and you answered. But as we sing that, as we close, since God has been so faithful about answering when we call, in my heart, I, I want to, but I'm, I'm almost afraid to sing it. Hey, when you call, I'll answer. Since when I called, you answered. When, I, when you call now, I'll answer. That's what we desire and that's what we want. But what does it take? All right. I sit around and wait for bursts of passion and I'm still waiting sometimes we gotta move and I believe that God is calling us not just here but especially in our culture a church that's not afraid not afraid it's one of the biggest commands in scripture don't be afraid don't be afraid so as you sing as we sing God I called and you answered try to find a place in your heart where you can say God if you call I'll answer now because of what you've done for me. Would you stand?
guys can have a seat. As we uh, close out, I want to read to you Isaiah 6.8. It says, Then I heard a voice of the Lord calling, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. You know, we have the opportunity each and every day to do that, don't we? Just like the scripture says. And uh, it's not easy to get out of our comfort zone. It's not natural for us. We like, we like the known. We like the comfortable. We like the assurance of knowing we're safe. And uh, we know an outcome, right? Well, and so some kids never play sports because it's uncomfortable. There's failure in sports, right? And so some kids have to be pushed to that. Some kids can't take the failure of, uh, of messing up or missing a shot or striking out or dropping a ball or whatever that case may be. And we're no different as adults. We're afraid that we're going to say something wrong. So we don't say anything, do we? Mm. Right? And so it's hard to grow your faith inside your comfort zone. It doesn't happen very well. It's not very effective just to be able to sit around and read the Bible in your home and come to church and that be it. Your faith's not going to grow. You have to get outside your comfort zone. See, you can't be comfortable and courageous at the same time. You can be comfortable, you can be courageous, but you can't be both at the same time. Either it takes being courageous and getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, we have six of us uh, going to uh, Eastern Kentucky, and uh, I've been on many, many mission trips. Some of the guys going with us have been on trips before and helped people out and served and, and loved on people, but it's still out of our comfort zone. Just because we've done it before doesn't mean we're comfortable doing that. And we have that, whether you're going on the trip this week or not, you have the opportunity to uh, step out of your comfort zone and be courageous and lead people to the cross like Justin was just talking about. I want to read you this, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, our mission uh, team to come forward, and we're just going to pray over our group as we kind of end our service that way, okay? It's the Acts 1.8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have an opportunity to do that, and I'm so grateful and honored and, and even proud, I can be proud of this, of how we as a Revive Community Church love on our community. And uh, the call uh, yesterday to step up when regular people couldn't be at the, at, uh, at, uh, the food pantry and extra people came out to make sure that we had people to serve and, and give people groceries that, that they needed. Right? We had that. Last Sunday, we're all ready to be comfortable with our Sunday afternoon with our families and to ourselves. And there was a need across the street at the apartments without water. And 20 of you all, almost 20 of you all, got out of your comfort zone and went door to door to people you don't know to give them water and hand sanitizer and other things. We get out of our comfort zone, um, and I'm proud of that. But we're also called to go, too, right, to love on this community. But we're called to go uh, to the world. And so uh, we have an opportunity that six of us are going to do that this week. And... Uh, and uh, why don't you guys come up? Um, and uh, I've asked if uh, if I've asked you to pray over uh, the group. Why don't you come up as well and just come line up the group? Don't be don't be shy here. Uh, what I would like for us to do is uh, we're gonna have time of prayer, and I've asked uh, some people in the church to pray over specifically some certain things that uh, uh, that we can pray for for our group as we go this week. And so we're just going to kind of line up and, and say one extended prayer. We'll pass, pass the mic around and, and pray for that. But uh, before we do that, uh, uh, myself uh, will be going. Kevin Husk. This is Rick Montag is going. My dad, David Husk. Noah Hanks. Todd Edgel. One, two, three, four, five. And Randy uh, Gaynor. He's uh, at his church. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anybody else. Uh, Randy Gaynor's at his church this morning at Hoswell Methodist. And he's going to join us here in just a little bit. And join us as well. Uh, we're going to be going to Paintsville, uh, Kentucky, and uh, it's about four and a half hours away from here in eastern Kentucky, in the mountains. And uh, we found out just last week we're going to be working on a trailer, uh, replacing flooring, replacing windows, working on the roof, uh, replacing walls. It sounds like almost like a complete 
got this trailer. I don't know what happened to it, if a tree fell on it, or if it's just they haven't had money to take care of it, but it sounds like uh, it's in pretty poor shape. I don't know if they have plumbing or not. A lot of, uh, there's a, a high percentage, not a lot of people, but a high percentage of, uh, of people in Eastern Kentucky that don't have running water in their, in their home. So uh, we don't know really what we're getting into. We just know we're ready to, ready to serve. But uh, if, uh, if I've asked you to pray, will you kind of just uh, make a line somewhere where we can just kind of go down the row and I can pass the mic down and we'll, and we'll pray that way, okay? And uh, you can just stay right where you are and, and join us in prayer. If you're part of the family and you want to come up and pray with somebody or stand next to uh, your family member that's going on a trip, I encourage you to come on up. You can do that as well. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll close out with our prayer this way. I have one announcement afterwards, but uh, we'll, we'll do this first, okay? Justin, do you want to lead us off? We'll just come down this way. loving us so much that you would entrust us with your, your gospel. Lord, I just thank you for being with us this morning and, and your presence and your spirit and the equipping that you've given uh, these people as they go and as we go into the mission fields of our life. Lord, I, just, I thank you. I, I ask that you would go out in front of them and, be, and, and begin to work on people's hearts in advance, Lord, so that we can be there and do our part and deliver in the way that you would. Lord, I would pray that while, while our uh, missionaries are busy serving and sharing with people and giving all of themselves, Lord, that you would give them a space and a time like you did, Christ, to, to go and be alone with the Father. To be able to have that time of devotion where we can seek after your knowledge and your wisdom like fine treasure. Where we can adore you. Where we can m make our confessions. We can give you thanks and we can, st we can stand in the gap for others in prayer. And we can look at your scripture, Lord. I just pray that you would give them the space and, and, and give them the will to go and do it when they finally get that time, that free time, to go and be alone with you like your son did. In his name. Lord, I come to you this morning, and I'm, I'm thankful for, for you reminding us all this morning, Lord, through this sermon that uh, we are missionaries. We're missionaries right here. We're missionaries of and that our light for you has got to shine to the world. And so I thank you for these six men who have decided that that's what they're going to do this week. They've, they've given up some vacation time. They've given up some family time, whatever it is, Lord. And we thank you that they, they're just going to step forward believing that you're going to take care of this week for them. Lord, my special request for them is that you give them a time of relaxation. Even though they're going to be working so hard to uh, fix up somebody's home, Give them some time, some downtime, Lord. Uh, when they go to sleep, may it be peaceful sleep. When they have aches and pains, may they go away. If they have a minute to go fishing or play on guitars or just sit around and talk, whatever it be, Lord, that you be present with them and give them that peace and relaxation that also comes only from you and it refills them for the task that you have them to do, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sending them out. In Jesus' holy name. Our gracious Lord, I just thank you so much for these six men that have decided to do this. Already they have um, shown a boldness, Lord. But what I'm asking, Lord, what I've been asked to ask you for is a boldness like they've never experienced before. A confidence in what they're doing and that every chance they have to, uh, to show you, to allow people to see you through their hands, through their feet, through the words of their mouth, that Holy Spirit empower them with a boldness like they've never had before. Just confidence, Lord, in you that everything that they do is totally for you and that you be glorified. Lord, your word tells us that our good works are only for your glorification. And so, Heavenly Father, we just lift them up and we ask for a boldness, a confidence in you, Lord, in everything they do, and that they show your mighty works, Lord, and that you're still at work in this world, Lord, and that it is truly you at work. We will just give you the honor and the praise and the glory, Lord. Lord, we come before you today humbly and asking because we know with you all things are possible. Lord, as we send out our troops, these are our missionary troops we're sending out, uh, we ask that you be with their families back home, 
And let us as Revive and as Christians and the followers you support those families that they're leaving behind for this week um, to care for them or take care of their needs or whatever needs to happen that we can rally together and meet those families' needs. But also that, um, that our troops that we're sending out, um, that, that you, they would serve you because you said you called and we're going to answer and we're going to come to your rescue because when we serve you, when we serve others, we're serving you. And when we don't serve others, we're not serving you. Um, we just ask that, Lord, that you be with those families that they're serving. Uh, prepare what you have prepared for them already and that we can go before them and that they can meet their needs. Jesus, it was you who said, the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So, Father, I pray life upon this area of these people, and I bind in agreement with others, we bind the spirit of poverty, loneliness, rejection, addiction. Lord, I read that, that the only power there that can overcome these strong holds against these people is you, Lord, and we believe that, Lord, and we stand on that. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, in your name, Jesus, I pray that these men that are going in your name will be aware that you will give them a revelation of who they're really going for, who you really are, Lord, more of a revelation of just who you are. And, Lord, I pray that they will be aware of the power that's within them, the power that's over darkness, the power that's over all these things that I just mentioned, all the poverty and all the addictions. The power that is in them is greater than the power that's coming against these people. And I pray, Father, that when they come in contact with someone, I don't care if it's in a restaurant, that the river will overflow and it will touch these people, Lord. They won't have to work at it. It's just so full of you, Lord, that it will overflow and it will touch these people. And they'll feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you will stay there after they leave and do what they came to start, to finish what they started. And Father, I thank you for putting it in their hearts and put in the hearts of all of us, Lord, what we're actually called to do. And Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we're so thankful that uh, you've gathered this team. And Lord, my special request for this team is this, that each and every team member be used. Be used in just talking with someone or doing the work or a combination of both. But Lord, we just ask that you use each and every member of this team. And Lord, we lift them up because they're going from that comfort zone to the cross. And this is where we're at. And Lord, we thank you so much for this team. And we just ask that you will use them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, the, for, the, for this team. And, and we just pray that hearts will be touched through them. And that bonds will be formed. Uh, that, that person to person, this will be uh, a reflection of your love. And that the relationships that are formed will hold fast and just be bound in your love. Lord, we just ask that you, you watch over this team as they, as they travel uh, for, their, for their health, both spirit, spiritually and uh, for their physical health. Lord, watch them, make sure they're safe um, and, and those around them and uh, bring them home safely. Thank you. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As we uh, close, I just want to share this. Uh, we're going to Eastern Kentucky to be the missionaries, and and wherever you may find yourself this week, taking trips or visiting, uh, I challenge you to do the same and look for those opportunities to be bold and courageous and, and to move forward in that.